to our Berks County Commissioner's weekly COVID-19 update. Our focus, as we promised last week, uh, is going to be on the healthcare arena, addressing issues at the business level, issues uh, relative uh, to individuals. I want to welcome all of our participants on our side of the call, as well as those uh, that are tuning in uh, today. Uh, you may be watching us via Microsoft Teams Live. Uh, you may also be watching via the uh, County of Berks Facebook Live feed or the County of Berks YouTube Live uh, feed or uh, BCTV. Uh, all of those are various ways that uh, you can uh, watch. And through Microsoft Teams Live, uh, the Q&A box, you can participate. Now there's information listed. Uh, this is a press event primarily, but uh, if the press wants to ask a question, you may ask as many questions as you want. Just uh, tell us who you are and what media you represent. Uh, if you're an individual, the topic needs to be germane to uh, what is being discussed here. Uh, give us your name and the municipality that you are from, and we're limiting individuals uh, to one uh, comment uh, for this program. I am Commissioner Christian Leinbach. I chair the Board of Commissioners, and we're doing these weekly updates for the benefit of our community to provide you with information that we believe is critically important as we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, at this time, I want to recognize both of my colleagues for some opening comments, and we'll begin with the Vice Chair of our Board of Commissioners, Commissioner Kevin Barnhart. Thank you, Commissioner Leinbach, and thank you everyone for participating today. This is very important for us to get this information out and messaging out to the community. Three quick items uh, over and above what we're normally dealing with day in and day out with COVID-19 pandemic is uh, continue to strive to find out when the County of Berks will be receiving our CARES Act allocation from the federal government, which will be coming through the state and a significant portion of that money coming into Berks County will help us for continuing to pursue purchase of PPE, contact tracing and testing. Uh, we are actively engaged with community partners along with Dr. Mahalik, uh, Jessica Jones and Pam, uh, sorry, Pam from his office uh, to work with the community partners on contact tracing. That continues to be a very active role uh, that Dr. Mahalik and his st staff have taken on. Again, that's going to need some significant funding from the CARES Act, if not the county, and we're building a budget for that and should have that by tomorrow. Uh, so we're dealing with things on many fronts and one other item, we did about an hour length uh, long Facebook program last week with SOS Burke's Opioids Coalition to really detail the significant problems with the community with substance use disorder and it continues to be very prevalent even during this pandemic. So that was viewed by the same day over 1500 viewers. So we're getting the message out and today is really going to focus on medical, mental, and I just wanted to bring up also the substance use disorder piece that should not be missed in these conversations. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Rivera. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Leinbach. Uh, thank you to all of, of you who are watching this program here. Our goal is to be able to share as much information as possible with our residents. And one of the things we have to keep in mind is that this is not only a physical health crisis, but it's also affecting more and more people with mental health issues as well. And the longer we go on, the, long, uh, the more this will be uh, uh, prevalent in this situation. So I appreciate the doctors who are here. I appreciate also Dr. Mahalik will be here to talk about the mental health uh, part of this. One other thing uh, that I just want to let you know, and we've spoken about this before, but the county is working on a small business restart loan. More information will be out there, but if you know a business owner within Berks County, please let them know that the county is working on this and that there will be more information available shortly. They can always reach out to my office if they want uh, more information. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Commissioners Barnhart and Rivera. I appreciate uh, all the work uh, that you're doing uh, to help the residents and businesses of Berks County. Uh, today, we're very pleased to have some of our key healthcare partners uh, on the Microsoft Teams Live event to address some issues that are very serious when we look at uh, the challenges facing Berks County relative to COVID-19. Uh, our partners are representing uh, three different groups, uh, Tower Health Reading Hospital, uh, Penn State St. Joseph's Hospital, and the Berks County Medical Society. I wanna take a moment and welcome each of our guests. Uh, first of all, uh, we have Dr. Deborah Powell, MD. She is the section, section chief for infectious diseases and medical director for infection prevention at Tower Health Reading Hospital. Dr. Powell has been a frequent spokesperson for Tower on issues related to COVID-19 in the media and during town halls and other events. Welcome, Dr. Powell. We also have Dr. Michael Baxter, MD. He is the past chair of the Berks County Medical Society and past chair of Tower Health Family and Community Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Baxter. And then finally, we have Dr. Jeffrey Held. He is Vice President of Medical Affairs, Penn State St. Joseph's Hospital. And this isn't the first time uh, Dr. Held has appeared with the commissioners. Uh, we really appreciated uh, his involvement with uh, the kickoff of the Do Your Part campaign. And I don't think you heard this, Dr. Held, but uh, you did cause some problems for us uh, at that event. And I say that tongue in cheek. If you remember, uh, we decided everyone would take their mask off to speak and then put it back on. And you were the only one that kept your mask on. And sure enough, social media blew up afterwards, praising you and trashing all of us for taking our masks off. Uh, so you got it right. Uh, we've learned from that lesson and we're very glad uh, to have uh, you on the call. What we're going to do, uh, we're going to ask the questions and I would ask us, uh, our production folks, if you can make sure that the three speakers uh, are live. In the case of Dr. Baxter, you're on the phone only. Uh, we will pause, but I'm going to ask the question and whoever wants to tackle the question, uh, answer it. And if all three of you uh, want to answer it, that's absolutely fine. Uh, one, two, it's, it's entirely up to you. So thank you and let's jump right into the questions. I will ask the first question. Would you please share the hospital's perspective on current modeling and the improvement we've seen over the past several works weeks specifically for Berks County. And I'd be happy to take that one. Um, we're quite encouraged regarding the cases. We've seen a plateau in our cases peaking early in April and slightly declining since then. We track a number of numbers every day. So we're looking at doubling times and these have increased over time and that's our goal. We're out to 41 days for Reading Hospital and 33 days for the county. So the number of positive patients we have in house is declining. And that's great. And we've had, we've been very fortunate compared to New York City where we've had enough ventilators, we've had enough ICU beds, and we track these every single day. Our challenge is getting enough testing and the testing turnaround time. So we're overall, we're encouraged and we're uh, tracking also vulnerable populations, our nursing homes, we're seeing more cases there and we're helping them with their mandated testing for their residents and employees. So. We're overall, we're like, we're tracking the numbers daily and we're, we're encouraged at this time. Uh, Dr. Held or Dr. Baxter? Dr. Held's perspective, let me begin by apologizing for, for causing the controversy. <laughs> I, 
I, as a VPMA, I, I really have to follow the rules, so I, I do my best to do that. Um, we we at, at Penn State Health are really leveraging, not only sharing great data with Tower Health, and they've been sharing wonderful information with us, but we're leveraging the largesse of the organization to, to get data from multiple different sources between the state and our insurance company, and using this to help guide us as well. Um, we have also plateaued exactly around the same time as Tower Health and things are leveling off. We are in the process of preparing for the, the new realm of living with COVID. It, the idea is prepping the hospital to, to essentially treat the continued COVID patients that we're likely to see until a vaccine is developed uh, and to continue to treat uh, the rest of the population who is not COVID. Uh, or exposed to COVID with the idea that we have to figure out how to live with this virus and um, and treat our population, both who are infected with and those who are having health issues that are not directly related. Dr. Baxter. Chairman, <clears throat> this is Dr. Baxter. I'm not going to comment on the hospital's perspective, but I do want to say that uh, uh, on behalf of the Medical Society and, and I'm sure all of the county that uh, we want to thank our physicians, all our healthcare workers, both on the front line and those who are in backup positions. Uh, certainly, we've seen uh, mitigation of uh, COVID-19 throughout our local communities. That is due to a lot of hard work on behalf of all of us, but of course, a particular shout out to our healthcare workers. Thank you very much. Commissioner Barnhart, next question. Yes, a lot of information, misinformation going on out there. Whatever news outlet you look at, you don't know. But could you tell us from the business community if they're permitted to be open, what kind of precautions they should be taking? And as a resident, should I be wearing a mask, not wearing a mask? What there's? Could you please uh, kind of focus in on that? And if we see someone, whether business or an, another resident, not conforming, uh, how do we handle that? I think that's a good question. So I think that as people are out in public currently, they should be wearing a mask and we wear a fabric mask to protect other people from us, honestly. And then they protect us from with them wearing their masks. So it's, it's a reciprocal. So I think we can educate people why the mask is important. I'm encouraged as I'm out in and about, a lot of people are wearing masks now, so that's great. Uh, I am concerned with people wearing gloves and touching a whole lot of surfaces. I kind of gets rid of the benefit of having the gloves, so it's not really protecting anybody. And then sanitizing surfaces that might be uh, contaminated. So I think we can do a lot to educate the public on the most appropriate way to pre prevent themselves from getting infected. Dr. Held here, I, I would add to that the social distancing um, it, in in workplaces, in, in stores is key, keeping as far apart as you appropriately can, um, as, as well as uh, not only hand hygiene, but hygiene in the area. So using EPA approved cleaners for your home, as well as uh, places of business. I, I would, as a private citizen, I would not get involved. If a business isn't doing what you think is appropriate, don't give them your business. Uh, and there's no need to get involved with somebody else. If they're not wearing a mask, just move on and find someplace else. Thank you. And this is Dr. Baxter, and I just want to comment about masks. I know there's uh, somewhat of a, of a macho sense out there that uh, some people feel they don't need to wear a mask, but I want to remind people that really the purpose of the mask is not to protect, your, protect yourself so much, but to protect others. Mm -hmm. So by wearing a mask, and we're going to have to continue to wear a mask for uh, a while, certainly as we get into this new normal period, that everyone's talking about, but the purpose of the mask or the importance of the mask is really to protect those around you, uh, certainly at least as much as yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Commissioner Rivera, the next question. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Leinbach. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm gonna ask you to share what you believe businesses must do to prepare to open at some future date. Specifically, one, where can they secure appropriate health expertise and input? And two, how can they know that they have an effective plan in place? So there are a couple of really good references out there. The uh, PA Department of Health and the CDC have great links to guide businesses. I think that those resources are important. 
Uh, I think as businesses plan to reopen, they should have a plan in place. I've seen some really good, you mentioned Weaver's Hardware before we started today. Again, different organizations that are open now that are essential, who have somebody at the door, they kind of maintain how many people are going in and out of the, the business, that they do hand hygiene coming in, they do hand hygiene going out. I think there are things that every business can do. And as we ramp things up, it won't be back to 100%. They may be op operating like a 20% initially and then starting to scale as we open more businesses up. Thanks, Dr. Held. I 100% agree with Dr. Powell. I absolutely. The CDC and uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health has some great resources and it's really clear resources. It's very easy to understand what their recommendations are and finding that information. And then th that information I think is the key to help businesses and that would be the key resources. And this is Dr. Baxter and of course I agree with uh, uh, the other two uh, speakers. But I do want to point out that one particular document that uh, has really just been released is the uh, document at cd.gov, which is called Guidelines for Opening Up America. It really gives some straightforward uh, advice on uh, recommendations for individuals, recommendations for employers, recommendations for employees. So. Um, I would certainly recommend any uh, business owner that as they go through this process that they utilize the state health department guidelines, but also look at uh, cd.gov opening up America again. What's that website again? Well, that's uh, www.cd.gov. That's the main CDC uh, site. And then uh, that'll pop right up guidelines opening up America again. I do know that uh, on the county website, they have some really good information. Where I, Mark, I think has summarized that information, which, which also references the, the CDC website, which again, I think the CDC is an excellent resource. Yes, that is. I actually, we actually just posted that Highmark link up yesterday. We also uh, have the CDC business guide link. We have uh, the PA Department of Health and we have OSHA. OSHA is another one that has a very, uh, for OSHA regulated businesses on uh, COVID-19. The next question, it has become abundantly clear from Berks County death certificates that the elderly and those with underlying health conditions are most vulnerable to COVID-19. Uh, really, there's three parts to this question. Why is that the case? Secondly, what should we do as healthcare providers, local governments, businesses, and individuals to protect this segment of our population? And then thirdly, will these protections need to be in place longer than protections for the general population? This is Dr. Baxter, and uh, maybe I'll start off with this one. I suspect uh, that of the three of us, I've spent the most time in nursing homes in Berks County. Over the last 29, 30 years, I've had patients in probably every nursing home in Berks County, and I've been on the staff of at least five or six different nursing homes. And I think we realize that uh, these facilities have some real challenges, uh, even on a good day. Uh, certainly, they have some of the uh, sickest uh, individuals. Uh, age uh, alone is not a, uh, a, a clear determinant of one's health, but it certainly is a factor. And, uh, you know, pretty much by definition, uh, nursing homes have a predominance of elderly patients, although not every patient in a nursing home is elderly. They get some uh, other patients, but all of them have a certain number of disabilities um and uh health challenges so that's that's probably number one number two uh nursing facilities um uh, are like any other business uh have uh to concern themselves about uh, uh income and ex revenue and expenses uh paying staff uh hiring staff training staff uh, infection control issues, which Dr. Powell is very familiar with, are a real challenge. 
in uh, nursing home facilities that don't have uh, uh, the resources that hospitals do. Now, this is not to let them off the hook because obviously they need to practice uh, good uh, hygiene issues and to practice uh, good standards of, of medical care. But there are some real challenges in, um, in nursing homes. And actually, one of the things the Medical Society is looking at right now is to, in the future, um, work with uh, our local nursing facilities and uh, look at best practices and and try to help them with some of these really challenging issues that have particularly come to the forefront during this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And let me just say, you know, we've seen uh, as there's been various discussions about how to handle going forward, even some suggestions uh, that maybe, uh, you know, we should just uh, sacrifice a certain segment of our uh, community, in particular, I think people are alluding to nursing homes, those are elderly people, and maybe in order to have a, uh, a vibrant economy, uh, we just sort of uh, uh, sacrifice uh, some of those individuals. Well, I think most of us, certainly in the medical community, feel that that's unacceptable. We got to be able to protect those individuals while still building a strong and sound uh, economy. Let me just one or two more things and then I'll let the others uh, uh, join in. Um, certainly we need uh, appropriate protective, uh, you know, the PPEs. Uh, we need to do uh, uh, testing, more testing in uh, those facilities. Maybe Deb can uh, talk about that. And certainly an issue which is coming to the forefront. I saw an article in the Reading Eagle yesterday uh, about this, uh, which is case contact. Uh, all those things need to be done and we certainly need to focus on uh, uh, nursing homes where uh, uh, many of our cases are and uh, a large predominance of our uh, deaths unfortunately are occurring. No, I agree with you, Mike. So I think it's the combination of all their multiple medical conditions from the diabetes, heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, COPD. They have a lot of medical conditions and Regarding contact tracing, I think that's where we're going to have to go to in order to find the case, find the contacts, isolate them to prevent the spread of this infection. It's kind of a shame we didn't hit it as it was increasing in the country, but now as it's starting to decline, we could try to start to con congregate those people a little bit better. So in some of these nursing homes, we've seen up to 30% of the residents infected. And over the last several weeks, the Department of Health has mandated that we test nursing home residents and staff weekly. And that's been a challenge and we're ramping that up for a lot of the nursing homes that we serve in the county. So we're helping them comply and they are the most vulnerable. I agree with you. Dr. Held, um, it's not only elderly patients in nursing homes, but any elderly patient with comorbidities or any patient with comorbidities or, or you know, comorbidities mean heart disease, diabetes, any lung disease, COPD, asthma. Uh, if you think about when you were young, you could stay up late, say studying or, or enjoying life, uh, and then get up the next day and go to work. And, and you really were able to do that without difficulty. Now that I'm older, I do that and I feel it for days. It, it's the same kind of thing when you're sick. When you're ill, um, it takes a lot out of you. And when you're older and don't have those reserves, a, a simple illness can really knock you down significantly. And somebody with comorbidities is more likely to when they get that infection to suffer greater harm. And that's kind of why you do it. How do you protect yourself? If you do that, it's the standard um, wear masks, social distancing, you know, hand hygiene, clean, as well as cleaning your home. And how do you protect those people? It's the exact same thing. Wear masks when you're out in the community, wash your hands and social distancing. And some of the challenges here too is that we, a lot of the nursing homes implemented no visitor policies. And again, if they go off site, then they have to be quarantined. So they're doing the best uh, they can. I think the visitor policy is very tough for this population, especially for the dementia patients who now don't have the contact with their family, et cetera. So there are a lot of challenges with this population. I want to uh, interject here that if you have a question, uh, we have a couple already, but remind you that you can simply go to the Q&A box on your screen 
type the question in. If you're from the media, we ask for your name and the media you represent. If uh, you're an individual from the community, please give us your name and the municipality you are from. And we ask that you limit it to one question and that it be germane to the topic. We don't want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Powell about nuclear proliferation or something <laughs> like that. We will stick stick to the topic. Uh, Commissioner Rivera, the, the next question. Yeah, so the next question is, uh, if you can share any advice you have for Berks County residents in responding to COVID-19, basically one in the short term, which is the next several months, and uh, also in the long term, which would be the fall flu season through the spring of, of 2021. I know it's hard. We really don't know what's going to happen, but any advice that you have that you can share would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so for short term, I think we're going to continue social distancing. We're going to be wearing our masks for, for honestly for months and hand hygiene as businesses open and people get back to a quote normal routine, which won't be close to what our normal was. I would say that we won't be having large gatherings. You may have a small group gathering, maybe no more than five, uh, maybe 10 at some point, but the large gatherings where you see thousands of people at a football game or a baseball game, I think that's going to be further, much further out. And we're hoping that with coronaviruses that the, the incidents will decline as the weather gets warmer and we have increasing humidity, but that's not guaranteed with this uh, coronavirus. It's true of other ones, but again, this is novel and we're not sure how this is going to react. Regarding long-term, I'm worried about the fall uh, with the 1918 flu epidemic, we saw an increase again in the in the fall, uh, and then this may circulate in the winter months with influenza. So I'm concerned about the most vulnerable people if this resurges back in the fall. So thank you. I, I would add to, to that excellent uh, advice is I, I would make sure you stay healthy and get the appropriate vaccines for, you know, get the flu shot uh, when it comes out. If you're of the age where pneumonia vaccine is appropriate, definitely get that as well and do your best to stay healthy so that if you do get sick, you have the strength to fight it off. And it is Dr. Baxter just uh, uh, certainly agreeing with what's been said. Uh, I have uh, some concern. I'm sure it's shared by others that we've seen uh, states, local communities open up around the country that for some people, it's been like uh, a light switch, throw the switch and everything. Uh, they tend to uh, go back to normal. We know that that's not going to be the case. As I mentioned, uh, we're talking about a new normal, which uh, is going to let us loosen up, but it's not certainly going to return us to the way things were even three or four months ago. So I think uh, we're all going to have to uh, be very cognizant that uh, we're going to have to do things differently. We're going to have to adhere to uh, to the advice that we just received and we've received over and, and over again. And as summer comes and people want to get out and, and go to the shore and such, they're still going to need to take extra special uh, precautions to protect, if not themselves, at least to protect uh, those around them and uh, other members of the community. And kind of dovetailing on something Dr. Health said too, I think there's been some delay in medical care, especially for our pediatric populations. So I think that we should not forget to get those routine vaccinations and to get those. And what I'm also seeing in, from our institution, we're doing more video visits, telephonic visits. There's ways to contact your health provider without actually having to go on the premises. So I think more and more telemedicine is going to occur. And that's probably better for all of us that we have more interaction with our healthcare providers. Well, I would thanks. agree with I would agree with Go that ahead. that things are going to you know <laughs> really the, even the way we practice medicine is going to change and probably you know there's going to be some good come out of this as well and I agree that uh, that we should embrace some of those changes. Well, thank you very much uh, for your uh, answers to these questions. Uh, when we get to the very end, uh, I'm going to give each of you along with Dr. Ed. Uh, an opportunity after we're done answering questions to make any closing comments, any advice, any direction uh, that you want to provide. Uh, I didn't tell you that in advance. Uh, don't feel obligated, but if you'd like to give any parting 
words of wisdom or advice, we would uh, appreciate that very much. Um, at this time, I want to recognize our next presenter uh, is Dr. Ed Mahalik. Uh, he is the administrator of Berks County Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities, and he has been in that role for a very long time. Uh, we've asked him to address the mental health side. Uh, often when we're dealing with a crisis like uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we're focused on the health side as we should be, but there are clear mental health components. And we've asked him uh, to address three basic areas. One, uh, to talk about the overall mental health risk relative to the stay at home orders. Uh, secondly, overall mental health risk for employees facing layoffs or loss of their uh, job. And third, overall mental health risk to business owners losing value of their business and possibly uh, losing their business outright. Uh, Dr. Ed Mahalik, thank you for uh, being on the program today. Thank you very much, commissioners, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be on the panel with my esteemed medical colleagues. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be able to address some of the behavioral health aspects of this because when the novel coronavirus roared into the United States, mental health took a back seat. Behavioral health took a back seat. When I say behavioral health, I mean drug and alcohol, substance abuse, and addiction. And that was necessary because the number one priority has been and, and was making sure hospitals wouldn't be overwhelmed and that as many lives as possible could be saved. Schools closed, remote work became the norm, restaurants shuttered, getting together with friends was no longer possible. And new cycle after new cycle was filled with stories highlighting the ever increasing number of cases and deaths while unemployment soared as the experts tell us to levels not seen since the Great Depression. Any one of these shifts uh, understandably could have been expected to cause an increase in behavioral health issues. I believe they've created a perfect storm and, and now is the exact time to begin to talk about that. Uh, recently, the Centers for De Disease Control and Prevention, they do an annual survey called the National Health Interview. Last year at this time, in 2018, 3.4% of those who responded in the survey were likely to screen positive for uh, signs of serious mental illness. There, this April, it was done again, and there's an eight-fold increase in that, bringing up to almost 70% of the participants in that study showing signs of moderate to serious mental illness. That's concerning from a not, not a lot of perspectives. As we know, uh, most of us know suicide rates have been rising in the U.S. over the last two decades. The latest data available for in 2018 showed the highest age-adjusted suicide rate in our nation since 1941. This was prior to COVID-19 slamming into us. What's most concerning is that the remarkable social distancing interventions that have implemented to fundamentally reduce our human contact. While these steps are expected to re reduce the rate, and I believe sincerely they have and they were the right things to do, the potential for adverse incomes on suicide risk is high. Talking about economic stress and furloughs and layoffs, there's a lot of fear out there that the combination of canceled public events, closed businesses, shelter in place strategies will lead to a recession. Economic downturns are usually associated and generally are associated with higher suicide rates compared with periods of relative prosperity. Because of business having to face adversity and laying off people, schools being closed for indeterminate periods of time, and many parents and guardians being forced to take time off from work and time away from work to care for their children. And as you know, the stock market has experienced historic drops. Research has shown us that historically, periods of sustained economic stress could be associated with higher U.S. suicide rates in the future. I believe we all should be concerned about that. Leading theorist theories of, so of suicide emphasize the key role that social connections play in suicide prevention. Suicidal thoughts and behaviors are associated with social isolation and loneliness. And I know there's a lot of ways to, to stay in touch, but many of our elderly at this point that are in our systems now do not have access to internet or social media. Libraries are closed. The places they would normally go to, they're not there right now and they're not 
they're not open. So what we see is the most critical public health strategy for COVID-19 is social distancing and social distancing figures very much into people's emotional and mental health. Uh, when, lastly, when you talk about family and friends remaining isolated for individuals who are hospitalized, we have over 90,000 of our fellow Americans who have passed away because of COVID-19. They have not, their family members, many of them have not been able to be with them in a normal fashion. Uh, they've not been able to grieve normally, according to the undertakers that I've talked to, funeral directors. All these points the issues that we have to continue to address. And then we look at the area of unemployment with younger adults. They're more likely to lose their jobs in restaurants and stores. And prior to this, the job market was looking good. Now it's looking disastrous for the summer. So I believe as we move forward and continue to do exactly what the health experts have recommended us, we need to begin to turn our attention to the emotional well-being of our, our families and friends and our communities and think how else we can address this before we have a second wave of other issues. Thank you. Very nice. <clears throat>
Uh, we're also committing to uh, 5,000 uh, face masks, handing those out within the city. Those will be distributed by local nonprofit and community organizations, and we're asking them to distribute them to people who do not have a mask. We've also found uh, people that work at certain places, they'll give them a surgical mask, which has to last them for a week or two weeks. Uh, what we're handing out are cloth masks so that they're able to uh, wear them uh, and, and wash them and wear them again. So we have a, uh, a complete program put together, uh, just as uh, Dr. Powell mentioned. I also have been doing with the Hispanic Center some uh, Facebook lives, and we're going to continue to do that. So the Hispanic Center, the Dominican Association, the city, they've all been great partners in helping to educate and reach the Latino population, understanding that everyone uh, has to do their part uh, to be able to, to stop the spread here. This is Dr. Baxter. Just quickly, uh, good points have been made. Uh, I think we have seen uh, some economic factors in this pandemic uh, in particular, and it speaks to some of the issues which we've, uh, in particular the medical society has addressed with others in the community, which is access to care. And I hope one of the things we take away from this after we are able to sit down and, and look back at this and assess is how important it is that all aspects of the community have uh, uh, access to good, uh, sound quality health care. Amen. Any other comments? Okay, next question. Karen Shuey, Reading Eagle reporter. How close is Berks County to being ready to open up for business from a medical standpoint? Do we have enough testing? And are we prepared to do the necessary contact tracing? Yeah, these are some challenging questions. So I think we're close to opening maybe at 20% for some businesses. I think it has to be opened up slowly and very thoughtfully. Again, America's foundation is on small business and there's a lot of small businesses that won't survive this outbreak. So I realize that there's a lot of pressure to open, but we have to do it in a very organized, slow, slow fashion. Regarding the contact tracing, I think this is gonna be challenging. Uh, Berks County could use more, you know, our own state health department, county health department. And I know that uh, some of our social services like Co County Wellness is kind of looking at helping the county do some of that contact tracing. Talking to my colleagues in the Philadelphia area who are able to test uh, more specimens, they'll, they don't have enough testing capacity. So I think the testing capacity is going to be the main limiting factor. Again, screening patients and the population to figure out what our prevalence is, is going to be key for us to know where we are now. But looking at the prevalence studies that I've seen in LA, Santa Clara and California and New York, probably our prevalence in this area is probably about 5% or less. So we have a long time ahead of us until we get a vaccine that we're going to have to navigate this over several months, probably to up, a, up to a year from now. The governor um, and the public health department recommended 50 per 100,000 population uh, over a two week period. And, and following that data, we are trending in the right direction, but I still think uh, last time I looked at the data, we're probably about 800 cases over that, over a two week period. So we still have time before we can get to uh, a decrease in the volume of new cases. Just to add to that, Dr. Held, the challenge is adding more testing is going to send the numbers, the case numbers, the other direction. Dr. Mahalik, uh, would you like to add a little bit to the contact tracing question? Sure. Thank right you. now, um, I have been working on behalf of the commissioners with Co-County Wellness, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, both the Y Missing and the Berks County Community Foundations uh, and United Way to establish a pool and set up a process to do uh, contact testing under the guidance and support and the training of the Department of Health. Uh, we've been working very hard on a proposal all week that'll be presented in draft to the commissioners tomorrow morning, uh, to Commissioner Barnhart. Um, Co County Wellness has the experience stemming back to the HIV AIDS crisis that I believe uh, with the help of, of, of several other community organizations I'm relatively optimistic we can carry out what needs to be done. 
Um, it will be expensive in, in terms of the nonprofit sector, but I, I have confidence that mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. get moving on that. Thank you. Any other comments on uh, that question? Okay, next question. This is a comment from Nancy Yvette Milan from Mega Radio, Mega Reading 92.9 FM. And she's just writing in to say thank you for this information. The next question is being posed from Commissioner Rivera. And his question is, now that the warmer weather is here, more people will be going outside. What are the proper guidelines of usage of masks outside? When and where should I use a mask outside? Should I wear a mask when walking or riding bike at Grings Mill? How about walking downtown? I think most of us are clear with usage inside, but not outside usage as much. I think it's a good question. I think there's, there's a lot of confusion there. So we consider significant exposure to other people be within six feet. These are, this virus is spread by larger droplets. So if you're more than six feet away from other people and you're outside exercising, I think keeping a mask on while you exercise is, is hard to do. But if you're in close proximity to other people, you should always have a mask on. So if you're out jogging in a country setting and you're no one's around you, I don't think you need to wear a mask. If you're downtown Philadelphia and you're jogging in a more populated area, I would definitely have wear a mask. So it depends on the density of people who are around you while you're exercising. I would uh, carry a mask and hand sanitizer with you everywhere you go. Uh, put the mask on uh, when you come in contact with people and when in doubt, wear the mask. Mm -hmm. I, I rode my bike in from the Heritage Center to work yesterday morning. I had a mask on the whole time riding my bike. I've encountered about 15 people on the way home. Once I got to Grings Mill, it got flooded with people on that course. So there's no way anyone, it got pretty dense between Grings Mill and the Heritage Center. So most of the people I encountered had masks on. They are, they're understanding it. That's good. You, you know how you have spare change uh, in every pants pocket and purse, and whatever you name it, I have hand sanitizer and masks in every place imaginable, just so I don't forget. Any other comments to that question? Okay, next question, Mary. There's a question that was asked by Susan Hefner from Lower Heidelberg, which has been discussed. Uh, she had she had wanted the doctors to comment on the CDC criteria of less than 50 new cases per 100,000, and that was discussed uh, prior. Uh, Kelly McDonough from Spring Township. How can state and local government leaders work with small business owners to guarantee they have the proper amount of PPE and equipment to reopen safely for their business and their community? Yeah. That almost sounds like it's uh, more for the commissioners, but uh, it is. I think it, yes. Uh, yes. I think I, I think we heard we heard earlier that uh, you know some of the CARES money is uh, coming through to the county. Uh, hopefully that will be made available, and and I hope commissioners that you know there's there's a, a hotline or there's there's some way for any uh, business owner to contact the county that needs help with PPEs or uh, any of the other uh, items that we feel are essential before they uh, begin to proceed with uh, moving forward. I can just use the analogy of Lancaster received direct CARES Act money of about $95 million, about 23 million is going for PPE uh, and contact tracing and testing. Another portion about six million dollars for first responders to balance some of it for uh, business restarts. It seems like they're saving a little bit of that. We can portray that we may eventually receive something in the 70 million dollars, 75 million dollar range. And we we think we're going to have a lot of those numbers finalized by tomorrow. As Dr. Ed pointed out about contact tracing, we're going to have numbers from Co-County Wellness. So we can kind of put together a projected budget and then match that up with what we hope the Wolf administration will be sending over to Berks County. 
so we can stay on pace with our neighboring counties and uh, be effective and safe as we start to slowly reopen. Okay, uh, Mary, if you could go back, and I saw this as well, Susan Hefner. I'm, I'm on it, yes. You got it, very good. I, you see that. Uh, she had another section of her question related to the 50 of 100,000. Um, how does that criteria relate to small businesses opening? And should that criteria be met before they open? Correct, yeah. I was hoping Deb would take that one, but uh. <laughs> tough one. Um, I think that's the ideal situation, but we may have to open. To, I guess my thought is that maybe a maybe a slight opening of some small businesses, and, and doing it in a staggered approach might be more realistic. But I think it's a t it's a very tough question, and it's especially tough when you talk about dramatically increasing testing because when you dramatically increase testing, and Commissioner Barnhart and I were on a call with Governor Wolf on Friday, and it was with the Board of Directors of the County Commissioners Association, and I believe, uh, Kevin, it was Commissioner Craig Lehman from Lancaster County uh, asked just that question and said, we feel like the goalposts are being moved. We were first told you gotta flatten the curve, and we feel like we've done that. Then it was 50 cases per 100,000 over so many days. And then we're being told that's still in place, but we want you to take a portion of your CARES money and dramatically increase testing. The governor really didn't have an answer. Now in his defense, the governor isn't the, isn't the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and there was no one on from the Department of Health but that is difficult and I'm getting that question from businesses as well and it's it's hard to know the answer. I just want to clarify something I should have said earlier. The Lancaster budget forecasted tracing, testing, and PPE for a year, but according to the CARES Act restriction is you must expend that money before December 31st. Commissioner, I do want to emphasize that testing is extremely important. Right. We're using statistical models and guesses from other cities and states, studies to guess how many of our population are truly infected and not knowing the, the true number is it, it, really hampering us to, to really actively treat and, and get ahead of the disease. So testing is, is paramount. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'd like to address uh, Kelly's question in reference to the PPE and the equipment uh, for businesses to reopen safely. I think something that's important is for businesses to start from now and not wait until they're able to reopen, but to look at based on their business model, based on their location, what do they have to do to be able to open safely, to be able to protect both their employees and their clients. Each business is going to be a little bit different. Uh, so you have to start looking at it now and start preparing. So when the day comes that you're able to open, you have everything in place. I know the Greater Reading Chamber Alliance is putting some guidelines together. They'll be rolling that out. If you belong to a business association, they should have some information as well. Uh, the CDC had some guidelines also. So start preparing now. Uh, the PPE, if you know what your business needs, some just need masks, some may need a uh, mask and maybe face shield, other equipment, start getting it now. Uh, my wife's a realtor and she had ordered face masks, gloves, and uh, the uh, uh, boots for people to go into the houses. Their guidelines uh, are simply not to wear masks, but she was able to get them now. It's a little easier to get in smaller quantities now. Uh, so before there might be another rush on that, start preparing for those now. These are things that once the, the uh, small business loans come out uh, from the county, that's something you would be able to, to use to, to start getting ready as well. So that's something just for business owners to keep in mind. Okay, Mary, next question. Chuck, <clears throat> excuse me, Chuck Brandman, Muhlenberg Township. You've mentioned carrying hand sanitizer everywhere you go. Where can we find and purchase hand sanitizer? There hasn't been any available in the grocery stores for about two months. Hmm. 
Commissioner, I can uh, weigh in on that a bit. Um, we are starting to see those uh, consumer supply chains coming back up. Uh, I, I don't think we want to get into an advertisement here for any particular um, store chain or anything, but I will tell you that the the Redner's markets, which are a local regional chain, are carrying hand sanitizer that's being produced by local distilleries. Um, so it is definitely not easy to find. You can't just go and get Purell off the shelf at Target, but there are opportunities out there um, if you're able to go and search them out. But it, it does merit the point. It is, it is not an easy commodity to find. And it should only be being used when soap and water is not available. If you're using hand sanitizer when you have easy access to a sink, that's probably a mistake. Soap and water, hand sanitizer for when that's not a possibility. I, I would add uh, to that, uh, you can go on to Google and find out how to make your own hand sanitizer. The hand sanitizer that I carry around, uh, our oldest son made for my wife and I and put them in little uh, containers so that they're easily accessible. Any more questions, Mary? No. Okay. I want to thank everyone that joined us and I appreciate uh, my colleagues, Commissioner Barnhart, Commissioner Rivera, uh, the work that they're doing and the work that we're doing together. I, I just want to share with the public, uh, this is a very challenging time. It's, it's not an easy time for anyone. It's especially though difficult for people that are either dealing with the health uh, effects of COVID-19, illness, or death, but it's also very difficult for people that have lost jobs, don't know if there's going to be a job uh, for them to go back to, and it's tough for business across the board, but I know my colleagues and I have heard so much from small businesses that are days away or weeks away from saying they'll close never to reopen. Uh, let's do everything we can to help the people in our community. I'd like to give an opportunity uh, for closing comments and to give our uh, healthcare uh, uh, participants a little bit uh, additional time. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Mahalik uh, if you would open us up uh, with your closing comments. Then we'll go to Dr. Powell, then to Dr. Baxter, and then uh, to Dr. Hill. Dr. Mahalik. Thank you, Commissioner, and I appreciate uh, the comments of, of my medical colleagues also. Um, a lot of the things that I had talked about are, are mentioned as, a, as an ingredient to how we move forward. Uh, the very elements that we are utilizing to stem the, the spread of this disease are things to be concerned about and considered. However, we're about to launch a major advertising campaign on our buses and billboards that all of our 24 hour seven helplines are available, our text lines available. Uh, our staff are still available to go out and discuss with people their concerns and, and comfort them. Uh, we want them to know that they're not alone. We're out there in, in this together and that's a major major element to combating social isolation uh, and depression. So we're here for them. Our, our number is 610-236-0530. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ed. Dr. Powell. I just want to thank you for this opportunity to talk to your listeners. Uh, I think forums like this are really important to get information out to the public. And just to remind everyone to keep wearing their masks in public continue to social distance and to wash their hands. And I agree with Brian Gottschall, the best thing you can do is washing your hands, hand sanitizer if you don't have access to water and soap. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Powell and Dr. Baxter. Uh, yes, I agree. I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address your uh, viewers and listeners today. And also I want to thank the uh, commissioners for their thoughtful approach that they've taken. You know, we've seen all over the country, this has been a very divisive uh, uh, issue. And I appreciate that the three of you seem to, uh, you know, really as best you can want to keep the politics um, out of this. And I noticed the Redding Eagle yesterday 
uh, had an editorial about that, and I think you should be recognized and uh, congratulated for your efforts uh, to date. Um, I do want to say that the, that physicians, uh, you know, we're we're primarily focused on the health and wellness of our patients and all the people of Berks County. As you know, we take we actually take an oath to protect uh, our patients from harm. So that's foremost, but as uh, Ed Mahalik uh, pointed out, there's also an important piece to uh, uh, a person's family's uh, health from things like uh, employment, bringing home a paycheck. So we realize that uh, this is a very important question. I just wanna say the Medical Society is is certainly available and willing to uh, our, our uh, Executive Director T.J. Huckleberry, all of us with Jim Gerlach and the staff over at the Greater, Greater Reading uh, Chamber Alliance, uh, in any way we can uh, to help them uh, through this. But certainly we have to open up, but we have to open up appropriately. We have to be smart about this because the last thing any of us want is to have this rebound um, and be right back where we started. Nobody wants that. So we've got to be smart about that. That includes all the things we've talked about, uh, issues for employers, even employees. You know, employees have a responsibility in this as we begin to open up. Um, but, you know, we will get through this, of course. Um, unfortunately, this virus is, uh, is here to stay for quite a while. We can't uh, let that uh, pass by. Um, that's why testing, even though it will affect the numbers, that's why testing is so important uh, that we can keep track of it and that contact, uh, contact tracing will be a big part of this uh, too. So uh, we have to open up, but we have to do it appropriately. We have to do it smart. Medical Society, our, our medical staff is here to work with uh, the commissioners and the, and the business community and uh, and uh, our uh, efforts, I'm sure, will uh, pay off. Thank you very much, Dr. Baxter. And last but not least, Dr. Hill. Dr. Hill, uh, let's see. I think uh, Dr. Hill is not on the call. So uh, we're going to uh, wrap this up. I want to encourage uh, everyone still on the call, uh, don't hesitate to go to the website that Berks County has created called doyourpart.com, uh, specifically relating to what we talked about today. If you go to the resource section, there are resources for businesses specifically that deal with uh, health, uh, issues and for individuals. I encourage you to uh, check that out. The high mark link that was referenced earlier uh, has been added. I also want to note the Help Center is still open. We're now open five days a week, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The phone number for the Help Center is 610 320 6150, and the email is covid at county of Berks. Dot com. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. On behalf of the Berks County Commissioners, I thank you and ask everyone to please stay safe.